Welcome back to the Men's Divorce and Cordell Cordell video and podcast. I'm Scott Trout, CEO and managing partner of Cordell and Cordell. And we continue to bring you the latest information on family law as it's being affected by COVID-19 from around the country. And we bring to you a Cordell and Cordell attorney as well from around the country each podcast to give you updates, not only locally, but nationally on just topics involving family law. As I always begin every podcast, don't forget that this cannot be taken as an attorney-client relationship, and it is not legal advice. Uh, your circumstances, your facts would dictate potentially a different position, different strategy, and oftentimes different talking points. We're not going to give you advice today. We're just generally going to talk about particular topics of family law uh, and how they are affected in COVID-19 and perhaps some things that you can do uh, to take to your attorney. And when you're looking for an attorney, make sure you look for one that just practices exclusively in family law. Obviously, at Cordell & Cordell, we're available for consultations at 866-DADS-LAW, or you can find us on the web at cordellcordell.com. We're available for telephonic and virtual consultations, as well as in-person, where appropriate, keeping in mind health and safety for us and for you as well. So today, we're joined by Jared in Nebraska. Welcome. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. You know, as we start at each podcast, we want to give people updates. They always want to know. We haven't been to a Nebraska attorney in a while. So what's going on in the court systems in the Omaha-Lincoln area? Well, right now they're kind of all over the place. Um, they're much more open than they were you know, a month, two months ago. Um, it, it kind of depends on the judge, but they're, they're pretty open. They've always been pretty open. The, the one good thing about Nebraska, Iowa, is they've never been like completely shut down. We've done Zoom trials, we've done Zoom mediations, lots of um, hearings over the phone, uh, motions for temporaries, pretrial conferences, motions to compel. So we've really been able to move cases along uh, about as quickly as we normally would be able to. Um, for an example, we've got an attorney in our Omaha office in Lancaster County today, um, in-person trial the next two days, mask required, but otherwise it's mm -hmm. in-person. It was initially gonna be by Zoom and they've changed that to, to in-person with masks. So, Yep. Um, uh, they're, they're pretty open and, and things are finally starting to move along. That's good. You know, unfortunately, Nebraska, Iowa, unlike some of the other states we've talked about where they've been completely shut in New York and in California, it's good news for guys who need to do something to take advantage of their rights, enforce their rights, reduce child support, spousal support, or even just proceed with divorce that's been on hold for a lot of guys around the country. So it's good news that things are moving forward. Uh, we're all getting used to the Zoom technology as we're utilizing it today, which is, you know, seems to be easy. My kids have taught me how to use it. Uh, they knew better than, than I did. So it's a good thing. We're advancing ourselves. So today's topic, uh, many guys have submitted questions during our virtual town hall that we held for 12 weeks during COVID-19. Now that we transitioned uh, to a monthly town hall talking about specific issues, but they asked about property. Uh, it's always a question about how to divide property, you know, what constitutes marital and separate. And obviously it, it varies state by state and, you know, given that you're, you're in Nebraska, but generally talk to guys, maybe what's the, the process for dividing property generally, and then we can kind of drill down into the differences. Sure. So the division of the marital estate, the assets, debts, you know, typically the standards can be fair and equitable. Um, you know, so what's fair? Um, a lot of times that's going to be 50-50. Not always, kind of depends on the facts and circumstances of the case. Um, you know, in Nebraska, there's this three-step three, three step process, and that's pretty similar. You know, I've dealt with other states, and, and the processes are pretty similar. Always some differences. But in Nebraska, there's going to be a three-step process. Um, the first, first step is going to be to classify the asset debt as marital or non-marital. Um, these are assets and debts that were acquired during the marriage through joint efforts of the parties. Those are going to be your marital assets. Um, you know, one thing that always comes up to me in my initial consultations is, you know, throughout the marriage, I've paid for everything. I've paid all the bills, I've paid the mortgage, I've paid everything. Um, and a lot of times, unfortunately, I'm the bearer of bad news. Um, that, that's all still marital and subject to division and likely, likely, likely 50 50. Um, but it depends on the facts and circumstances. And so it, potentially we've got an argument that it's not going to be 50 50. Yeah. Um, the next step is essentially going to be valuing that asset or debt. Um, a lot of times that can be pretty straightforward. You know, the accounts, the numbers are what they are a lot of the times um, as far as bank accounts, um, credit card statements, retirement investment accounts. Um, those are those are tangible numbers, uh, but there's not a lot of wiggle room on those. But where we, we run into potential issues is going to be valuing um, house, 
a house, real estate, um, businesses, and potentially vehicles. Uh, there are times you get into disputes as to values of vehicles. So when that's the case, uh, we need to obtain an expert. Um, we have to hire an expert. You know, ultimately, as an attorney, we're going to do the cost-benefit analysis. Like, look, this expert going to cost you, you know, approximately this much. Um, and here's here's kind of the numbers we're looking at. So, you know, is it worth it to you? You know, ultimately, uh, an expert's opinion is going to be much more credible to a court than than one of the parties saying their house is worth X, Y, and Z. Um, they're going to take that appraisal over over many other things. You know, uh, an accounting assessment or a Zillow estimate. Zestimate, I think they call them. Um, right. <laughs> so that, that's when, you know, ultimately you kind of think that the asset debt division, you know, they come in 50 50, it's easy. And sometimes it is. Yeah. Um, but if we can't agree on, on the high number of stuff like a business or, or, or a house, um, then we, we need to get experts involved. Yeah. Um, and then the final step is going to be to calculate and divide the, the marital estate. Um, you know, once we have that determined, what's the marital estate? What's it consist of? Um, we start uh, determining what's a fair and equal distribution of that. Again, typically 50-50, but not always. Um, and if, if after that distribution, you know who's gonna get which assets, who's gonna pay which debts, um, if one of the parties is coming out ahead in that distribution, oftentimes that other party, or the, the party coming out ahead is going to pay the party coming out behind an um, equalization payment. To, to make it 50 50 that's pretty standard you know if we go to court the judge is going to do that so you know we know that when we're discussing settlements so that's what we're looking at um and that equalization you know, payment a lot of times is a lump sum payment you're right you know, a lot of people that don't have that you know it, it, it could be fairly high dollar um and they're going to say i don't know you know I, how am i supposed to pay that because usually you get 30 to 60 days well a lot of times that's going to become available through refinancing the house Mm -hmm. or borrowing against the, you know, a business value or, or through retirement accounts, any yep. individual or retirement account. Um, uh, and so, and then another thing to, to be consider, considerate of when dividing the marital estate is we're dealing with qualified assets and, and non-qualified assets. So uh, they're, they're treated differently. Um, and so if you're going to do that, are you going to have two divisions? You're going to have a qualified asset division and a non-qualified asset division, or are you going to have one division? If you're going to have one division, you really need to take into account the tax treatment and penalty treatment on the on the retirement accounts. A lot of times you might reduce that value by 25% and just do one global division of assets and debts, taking into account um, the taxes and penalties that would occur if you were to, to liquidate or, or cash out the retirement accounts. Yeah. You know, one of the things I was meeting with a client last week talking about property is it, it, some things properties overlooked and you know at the end of the case they're saying well you know now she's got all this property she's got a lot more than i did and they didn't list it out you know and i always tell clients ignore for the moment marital or separate or where it came from just for the moment list everything out period and then let's assign some values to it let's try to figure it out and let's use our best estimate and as you suggest there are occasions when you have to hire an expert to appropriately value things and to make sure we're not undervaluing or overvaluing it obviously if we're taking it maybe undervalue is a good thing but the point is, is if we're giving it away we want to make sure it's the accurate value uh, but list everything but you know the separate property issue is a big deal uh, because we certainly uh, it depends on the state like in Missouri it can affect the division of property but um, maybe explain to guys how separate property, you know, what it typically is and how the courts may deal with it. Sure. So separate property, usually that's going to be property that's owned by the parties, but it's not going to be included into the division of the marital estate. Typically that's going to look like either something that was gifted specifically to that party only, um, something inherited uh, either prior to the marriage, during the marriage, or premarital, non-marital, it was accumulated prior to the marriage. So, and with that, you know, typically we're going to, you know, when you talk about burdens, you're often thinking criminal law or civil litigation. Um, but in this case, for domestic litigation purposes, there is a burden here. The burden is on the party seeking to, to have that, that property classified as separate property. Um, so you need to meet that burden when, when you go to court. Um, a lot of times you're gonna meet that burden to be, you're going to demonstrate to the court that it's, it's, it's remained separate 
and it's traceable, and that's going to be through a paper trail. Um, and so that that also that that com becomes clear to the court. Look, it hasn't been commingled, which I'll talk about, and it uh, it's clearly premarital or inherited, and um, solely for that party. A, a lot of times, I'll have prospective clients come in on these initial consultations, and they believe everything's titled in my name. Slam dunk. Yeah. You know, it's my property. She's not touching it. Well, that's not the case. You know, typically. Um, how it's titled or how it's transferred is, I don't want to say irrelevant, um, but it's not as big of a factor as a lot of people think. Um, it's, it's more about how and when was it acquired. Um, so uh, that's something that, um, like I said, a lot of people think it is a slam dunk case. So, so you really want to be careful with, with any inherited property, gifted property, and, and, and keeping it separate. Yeah. I mean, separate properties – so key once you identify it and particularly if you don't have possession of it so i've had guys come to me they had other lawyers and it's post divorce and they say hey you know what i want my separate property back she hasn't given it to me and then we look at the decree and it's not outlined it's not awarded to him it's pretty clear it's his separate property because he came to the marriage with it <laughs> let's just call it personal things you mm -hmm. know boxes of stuff and the the best piece of advice when we talk about it is if you want it identify it and if you want, not only identify it, but make mention of it in any settlement or any decree, hey, it's awarded to you so that you can enforce it because there's always this catch-all provision in judgments that says, you know, property not specifically awarded herein is awarded to the party in possession. Mm -hmm. So even though you know it's not yours, it's yeah. now yours. And, and so, they know it's not. Of they course. Know too, but they yeah. want you to prove it. Yeah. You can see that a lot with tools and guns. Yeah, you know, they, absolutely. They're premarital, and they're worth a lot of money. The other side is going to say they're worth, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. Get that yeah. on the sheet, and you can't prove it's not premarital. Right. For some dads out there, the coronavirus pandemic has become a pretext to limit access to their children. Other dads have been pushed out of key decisions affecting their children's lives. If you're one of those dads. Cordell & Cordell is here for you, as always, but with expanded services. We can meet you in person or by video conference on weekdays, evenings, or weekends. Our goal is to step up our service to meet your needs now. So talk to them about a little commingling and how you can kind of what we call transmute or uh, separate into marital, because that's always a, a caution point that if you're going to, if you want to maintain its status, and sometimes we particularly talk about bank accounts that have always been out there, property, it's always been out there. Maybe just a quick word of caution about how, what steps guys can do, what they need to be aware of so they don't turn something from separate into marital. Yeah. So one way separate pro property is going to become marital um, and subject to division is going to be commingling. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you're taking an inheritance um, or you're taking um, a gift specifically for you and you place it into a joint account, um, it's likely going to lose that separate property title. Um, it, it, it's going to become marital. It's going to be subject division. Again, that's why it's so important to keep it separate, keep that paper trail. Um, it, you know, I see that a lot as well is where they, they commingle it and, and, we're, and we're done to some extent. Um, and so, because the way the court's going to view that is it, it's an intent by that party to make it marital and make it beneficial to the marriage. You know, right. That's the interpretation of that. And, and, and to, some, to some extent, that's probably accurate. So one thing that I've, I've found is courts are more open to, let's say you take a down payment from inheritance um, or a gift specifically for you, down, and you put that um, on a down payment on the house that's jointly titled. If you can prove that, um, a lot of times courts will give you credit for that. You know, show the paper trail. Um, so that's one way we've been successful, even though it's in a way commingled because you're putting it in that joint asset. Um, you could still be successful on and getting that taken out of the division and you get, you know, when it comes to the house equity, you're going to get that off the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's just a great conversation. That's why the first step when I talk to clients is I make sure I say, just come in with listing all property and then we'll work on identifying the separate and giving you specific steps on how to avoid transmuting it. And does it the same thing go for debts as well? Yes. So with debts, that's your interesting, you know, as far as separate debts go, uh, you know, because a lot of times, you know, 
one party is going to be seeking that the, their debt is always factored in. Um, and the other side is going to want it, want, it, want it added because it has a significant impact on the, on the balance sheet. Um, uh, and it's going to be based upon the facts. Uh, you know, acquiring debt during the marriage that did not benefit the marriage could be offset or, 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 or put aside in, in the vision of assets and debts. Um, a couple ways you might see that is like gambling debts. You know, that obviously those probably didn't benefit the marriage. And, and, and so they shouldn't be factored into, into the division of the assets, debts. Uh, debts for a significant other, uh, you know, trips, gifts for that significant other. Those aren't going to be factored in. And it's important because the more debt you're, you're assigned in the division of the assets, debts, the more assets you're going to get. So that's why it's important, you know, why, why people don't want that factored in. One, one debt that I'm seeing more and more often um, that's tricky, student loans. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say when I initially started to practice several years ago, um, student loans were a separate debt. Mm -hmm. That's it. Done. Um, he, he or she's taken those and that's it. Um, but that it's becoming more and more, um, common for the court to actually really consider it. Uh, you know, based upon legal authority in Nebraska and I, I can tell you, you can, you can have legal authority to support any argument you want when it comes to the, to the student loans. Um, uh, but they're often a very significant debt. And so that's why they're so important. Um, because yeah. if you get assigned those in, in the divorce or consider marital, that's mm -hmm. going to offset an asset pretty significantly. So it's always a huge issue. The trend has essentially been more, uh, we're open to considering that marital debt, whether it's uh, accumulated during marriage or not. Um, oftentimes the argument against including them is that that party um, that incurred the debt will be the only one benefiting from that debt. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the income that comes with those student loans likely. Uh, however, you know, if it's an alimony case or a spousal support case, then, then that party's going to, the other opposing party's going to continue to benefit from those student loans and probably did throughout the marriage. So it, it, I, I've seen, you know, if these, if these student loans w were accumulated during the marriage early on, you know, then they received that benefit for probably several years. If you, if, accumulate those during the marriage, but closer to the date of divorce, maybe that other party's going to benefit as much as mm -hmm. it originally and not, it's going to be considered separate of that. Yeah. And it's, a, I think it's one thing to even not necessarily worry about how do you deal with it, uh, but maybe use to your advantage. Right. Um, and again, as you suggest, if, if courts are looking to call these marital debts and you know, your guy coming in with some debt, use it, use it as a, as a kind of a sword to try to get something else. Ultimately you may take it, but maybe paying down alimony, getting whatever, you, you know, th that's the whole point in family law is to find an advantage, use it in the negotiation. Um, and then, you know, use it to get the goals that you have. And so it's, it's a conversation. It's a good point to bring up with a, a student debt because it is a kind of a, a very progressing type of issue across the country and how courts are dealing with it. So yeah, yeah go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. So Jared, thanks. That's uh, all the time we have for today. It's really good stuff to just walk our guys through property. It's really kind of a, you know, the very beginning part and you have a consultation is to talk about what you have, uh, what you make, and uh, that gives your attorney a good idea of an analysis of, of what you need to deal with. So thanks for joining us today and giving guys some good information. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me on. As always, continue to tune in. Uh, we're going to continue to bring you to podcasts and different topics affecting guys during COVID-19 as well as afterwards as we continue to open the country back up now in week 13, going into week 14. So continue to tune in. Also in the virtual town hall that we'll be bringing to you in the first week of July, we'll be bringing to you specific points as it relates to family law and affecting guys. Tune in, go to cordellcordell.com. Give us a call at 866-DADS-LAW if you need to spe uh, schedule a consultation, telephonic, virtual, or in person where appropriate. Until next time, have a great week.